You ordered health care, you got airstrikes. Notes from the edge of the narrative matrix. Americans. Health care, please. Biden. Sorry, did you say airstrikes on Iraq and Syria? Americans. No, health care. Biden. All right, you drive a hard bargain, but here are your airstrikes on Iraq and Syria. It is journalistic malpractice to parrot U.S. government claims about acts of military mass murder being defensive. The only strikes near the Iraq-Syria border that could accurately be called defensive are those launched by the inhabitants of those nations upon the invading Western military occupation. The only actual defensive action that the U.S. could legitimately take to protect troops in the Middle East would be to remove U.S. troops from the Middle East. Those who said, we can push Biden to the left get criticized every time this administration takes another rightward turn. But they don't get criticized enough for the fact that they never even try to push Biden to the left. At no point have they ever even tried. Nobody in America had any idea the parliamentarian existed until the Democrats needed an excuse not to advance progressive causes. The Biden administration is killing people around the world and ramping up Cold War escalations while eroding civil rights with new domestic terror policies. So naturally, Republicans are focused on worrying about dying in imaginary death camps during an imaginary white people holocaust. Yeah, okay, let's give control of the world to the nation built from slavery and genocide and founded by witch-burning Puritan lunatics. What could go wrong? It's a safe bet that if the world found all the profoundly evil things the U.S. government and its allies did in Syria, it would damage U.S. imperialist consensus building far worse than Iraq. That's why so much narrative management gets poured into ensuring this never happens. The whole intercept slash TYT foreign policy shtick is going, it's possible to promote all CIA, CNN narratives about every U.S. targeted government and give meaningless lip service to opposing war against those governments. You can do both. Mehdi Hassan built a whole career on this. Many right-wing conspiracy theories began as left-wing conspiracy facts. I started saying U.S. intelligence cartel a while back because the cutesy label U.S. intelligence community was like saying the ISIS capades. Isn't it weird how we've learned that the U.S. prosecution against Julian Assange relied heavily on false testimony from a diagnosed sociopath and convicted child molester, yet Assange is still in prison? We haven't seen anything like the complete mass media blackout on Stunden's revelation that the Assange prosecution relied on false testimony since the complete mass media blackout on the OPCW leaks. In the information age, the powerful put emphasis not just on managing what information gets out to the public, but how that information is received and perceived. Now legit bombshells like the Stunden story and the OPCW leaks can come out without having any impact, just due to perception management. In this new paradigm, investigative reporting and whistleblowing are still important, but just as important as obtaining the information is addressing the problem of getting it unfiltered into public attention. Doesn't matter what information you get if no one sees it, and even if it is seen, you still need to deal with the imperial media spinning what's seen in a power-serving way. Today, you could publish solid, indisputable proof that the FBI was behind the Capitol riot, for example, and the narrative managers would quickly manipulate it into a nothing burger. Almost all good business practices are terrible human being practices. To be a good businessman, you have to harden the humanity out of you. This is why capitalism creates and elevates terrible humans, and why we are being led into extinction by assholes. 
Even seemingly benign business practices like maintaining cash flow are inherently corrosive to human nature. You need to break something good in you in order to hold back from paying people for as long as possible while chasing people to pay you ASAP to keep your cash flow up. Interrupting criticisms of capitalism to yell, That's not real capitalism, is like interrupting a magic show to yell, That's not real magic. Okay, it's not the imaginary fantasy thing you have in your head, but it's also the only way the thing we're discussing has ever existed and ever will exist. It's not just that the intelligent people are full of doubts while the stupid ones are full of confidence, as Bukowski said. It's that people with empathy and humility can be shamed and intimidated into silence by the crowd, while narcissists just dismiss the crowd as irrelevant insects. The result is that the real artists and visionaries with solid grounding in their inner depths are often brutalized into silence by those who throw rocks at things that shine, while those without functioning empathy centers rise to positions of significant influence. And I think maybe the lesson here is that we must become so very awake that we have the inner spaciousness to tolerate and heal our way through a bombardment of attacks. Certainty that humanity is doomed is not a reality-based position. We barely know anything about our universe, our minds, or our world. Anything is possible. Rigid pessimism about our fate is grounded in ignorance and intellectual arrogance, not realism. Doesn't mean things aren't bad, but there's no rational reason to give up hope or stop fighting. It is true that we are plunging headlong into a continuum of exponentially expanding weirdness and familiar patterns are evaporating very rapidly. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. To paraphrase Krishnamurti, it is no measure of health to preserve normality in a profoundly sick society. <laughs>